Welcome back to our series on transformational leadership. Uh, let me remind you that there are a couple of other resources in addition to these videos uh, that hopefully will help you in, in being the, the best transformational leader that you can be for your family or for your company, your business, uh, for the community, or, or certainly for the church. Uh, one of those is the book, Speak Freedom, uh, Developing Transformational Leaders in the Struggle for Justice. And then we have a workbook, uh, the workbook on, on transformational leadership. Uh, both of these resources will be available online. And we, it's our prayer that these will be able to help you as you work through these, these concepts uh, so that we can make a difference uh, for those people who are living under unjust systems uh, in, in the world that's around us. Well, uh, in, in our previous session, we talked about that there are three important principles for being effective transformational leaders. The first of these is living with passion. How can we live with passion? How can we understand what God created us to be and to do? How can He transform our hearts so that we might be able to work for the transformation of those who are under oppressed systems? During this session, we'll talk about how to discern our kingdom assignment. I believe that when God created you, He, he created you as a unique person. Uh, you have different DNA, but you also have different uh, talents, different gifts, different life experiences, uh, different passions. And so during this session this morning, we want to find out how can we know what our kingdom assignment is? Uh, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Uh, hypocrisy will never bring freedom or joy or hope. Uh, it complicates our lives and, and, and challenges us to live lives less than the fulfilled lives that God created us for. And so it's when we understand that God does love us and that God has created us uniquely and with His own passion so that we might make a difference for those who are most vulnerable around the world. How can we live with passion? Uh, transformation must precede passion. How can we transform society when, when our own hearts uh, need to be transformed? In Romans 12, 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you'll prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. William Wilberforce is one of my heroes, and, and he was prim primarily the one who led in the, uh, the uprising of the people in England to stand against the horrible issue of slavery. Uh, he didn't do this by himself. God brought others in his path as he built a team to overcome this atrocity. Uh, but, but for Wilberforce, before he could bring peace to slaves, he had to find his own personal peace with God. Uh, transformation came for him only after God's conviction, his own brokenness, uh, his own confessing, and his own yielding to God for God's plan for his life. Uh, when God touched his heart and the hardness of his own heart, then he began to understand that slaves were people, individuals that God loved, and he wanted to make a difference for them to bring about uh, their lives of, of hope and, and fulfillment. Well, this, this didn't happen all at once. Uh, at a very young age, uh, William Wibbleforce was already one of the most influential men in England. Uh, when he was just 25 years old, he had what was the most influential post in the British Parliament. Uh, you would have thought that that by itself would have brought about fulfillment and satisfaction. He had the wealth uh, of, of, of all. He, he belonged to five different social clubs in London. Uh, he was invited to all of the events. The prime minister uh, was one of his best friends. And yet, there was an emptiness in his heart. Uh, there was something missing in, in, in uh, William Wilberforce's life. And so he began what he called the search for what ended up being the great change in his life. Now, there were people that lived much before him who were direct influencers on the change that happened in Wilberforce's life. Uh, before Wilberforce was even born, there were three students at Oxford University, uh, John and Charles Wesley, who were brothers, and then a third person, George Whitfield. 
these three came together in, in, in a Bible study, in a prayer, that they might be used of God to make a difference. God took these three students and did dramatic things with them. As a matter of fact, it was John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield that are the primary ones who brought about what has been called the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening in all of England, but also the Great Awakening in the colonies, the, the young American colonies. What these men uh, shared the hope of Christ, not just in the pulpits of the churches in, in their land, because many of the pastors, many of the rectors in these churches didn't want them preaching in their own congregation, to their own congregations, uh, because they threatened their own places of, of leadership and security. And so they took the gospel to the people. In the colonies, George Whitfield, since he wasn't invited to preach behind the pulpits of the churches, went out into the open fields. There were as many as 30 or 40,000 people who gathered together to hear George Whitfield preach. Uh, even without mics or, 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 or technology, he spoke so loudly and so boldly that, that these people clung to every word that he said. His gospel was different than what they were hearing in the churches. Uh, these religious leaders were trying to uh, uh, oppress and, and keep people under control. But George Whitfield preached about a Jesus, a Lord, who loves us, uh, who, who loves women and men, who loves blacks, whites, and Indians, people of all races and all cultures. And so when he preached this freedom in Christ, thousands of people's lives were changed. When William Wilberforce was just a young boy, there was a tragedy that happened in his home, and he was sent to live with his aunt and uncle. Uh, they were uh, Uncle William and Aunt Hannah, uh, who, who lived in Wimbledon in England. When Wilberforce's mother sent him to live with them, she didn't realize that they had had a change in their own heart. They were part of a movement that was called Methodism. Now, they, they didn't call them that as a compliment. They actually were people who were ridiculing them. Well, the, his, his Uncle William and Aunt Hannah were very wealthy people and very influential people. Uh, but, but they had this, this commitment that they made to Christ to live as Christ followers. George Whitville actually became one of their friends and, and oftentimes visited in the, with them in their home in Wimbledon, England. There was another man, John Newton, who was a pastor of an Anglican church in England. John Newton himself had been the captain of a slave ship. He had a hard heart until God touched his life, and Newton was changed and, and it became compassionate about those for whom he had brought about severe oppression. Well, as William Wilberforce, or little Billy as he was named then, it came under the influence of, of his aunt and his uncle and, and people like John Newton, then he began to inquire himself about what does it mean to, to have that kind of freedom in faith? His mother found out that what she thought, these, his aunt and uncle were, were religious radicals, and she quickly brought him home and, and tried to rid him of all of the notions that he had been taught by his aunt and uncle. And yet those feelings remained deeply within Wilberforce's heart. Well, pretty soon he was going about what everybody else was. He, he, wanted, to be, he wanted to be wealthy. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to be popular. And, and he suppressed all of those feelings of, of, of his desire uh, uh, to be faithful uh, in, in, in God's service. Uh, once, even after he had been elected to this influential post in Parliament, he took a trip to France, and he invited with him Isaac Milner. Uh, Isaac Milner was one of the most brilliant men in the world at that time. Uh, some said that he was the Stephen Hawkins of, of his day. Well, when, when these two men began to travel together, when Isaac Milner and, and, and Wilberforce traveled together, uh, Wilberforce's sister had brought along with her a book that was entitled The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul by Philip Doddridge. Uh, as they began to look at that book, Wilberforce asked uh, uh, Isaac Milner, have you ever read the book? And, and, and Milner said, oh, it's the most influential book he'd ever read. 
and it had changed his heart. So every day they began to read the book together and discuss uh, the implications of the book. During that time, God just created a turmoil in the soul of William Wilberforce. He was restless and depressed and anxious. All the power that he had, all the wealth that he had, all the friends that he had, no longer satisfied him. He, he began to wonder that, that God had created him and, and God had made him for a special kingdom assignment, and he, he believed he was missing out on that. While he was there at Parliament, he decided to visit an old friend, and that was this elder John uh, Newton, who was a rector of a church then in, in the London area. He went to Newton to describe this, this distress of his soul. He thought Newton would probably tell him, okay, you need to leave the Parliament, and you need to become a pastor. He was really surprised when Newton told him, no, you need to make this commitment of your life to Christ and then return to Parliament and serve God there as a member of Parliament. Well, God changed Wilberforce's life. And when God changed his heart, he began to see other people through different eyes. He became burdened for slaves. Hundreds of thousands of slaves sold uh, uh, to, to, to greedy uh, uh, people around the world for their own personal pleasure and profit. And he began a journey to abolish slavery in England. It was not an easy journey. As a matter of fact, he spent the rest of his life with this as his one primary purpose. There were times when they had some victories, some small wins, and there were many times when there were setbacks. Uh, he faced opposition uh, from, from, from many because uh, th they felt threatened that it would affect their own finances and their own security. People didn't want others to know about the truthfulness of slavery. And when Wilberforce discomforted them by speaking out against this atrocity, they wanted him silenced. And yet he persisted. He persisted until three days before he died. William Wilberforce was able to live to see the abolition of slavery take place in England. Oh, there's a power in purpose. When you know your purpose in life, it makes a difference. Uh, there in Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah in, in chapter 29 of his prophecy, it said, I know the plans. He said, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you, God said. You will seek me when you search for me with all of your heart. Do you know that God has a plan for your life? Do you know that God wants you to make a difference in the world? That God is equipping you and ready to surround you? He listens to us when we cry out about, the, about these things that oppress us. Oh, when Wilberforce knew his purpose, he knew that being a transformational leader is not some burning desire for, for personal greatness. It's a recognition that God has a plan for your life. Worldly accomplishments will never fill the hunger in your soul to live for the purpose for which you have been created. One example of that in the Bible is Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah was a part of those who were taken into slavery or captivity by the Babylonians. The nation of Babylon fought against uh, the nation of Judah and, and took them captive and, and burned their cities. Now, when Nehemiah was, was there in, in this new land, uh, he re very quickly rose to power and ended up uh, being a very special person to the king himself. He was the, the cupbearer of the king. But his heart was still back there in Judah, back in Jerusalem that had been burned down and destroyed uh, by the Babylonians. When his brother came from Jerusalem, he asked the condition of his, of his fellow brothers, uh, brothers and sisters, and his brother told him the conditions are horrible. They're, they're horrible there. The, the walls have been torn down uh, and burned. The, the temple was destroyed, and the people are in great distress. 
Nehemiah could have been comforted in his own place of security, and yet God gave him a burden for the people back in Jerusalem. And for months, Nehemiah cried, wept, and prayed. Prayed to the God of heaven that God would be able to use him to bring about relief for his fellow man. Well, God did open the path for him, and, and Nehemiah would receive the blessings of the king and went back. And by God's grace, he came together with a plan, a strategy. He united the people. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, uh, helping it once again to become some of the, the splendor of those years uh, before the destruction. These people like, like Nehemiah, like William Wilberforce, like in America, Martin Luther King Jr., they have a God-given burden for justice. And this, this must precede meaningful change. Uh, emergent leaders, transformational leaders, face significant opposition anytime systemic change is being considered. A leader must understand the problem before he or she can even recommend a solution. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized that there was a problem in America. In, in, in America, there's supposed to be freedom and justice for all. But there wasn't freedom and justice for all. There was a different set of standards and rules by which the blacks in America lived from the whites. The horrible situation of segregation uh, was established. Uh, uh, an oppressive situation that later would be called the Jim Crow laws, which kept blacks in their place of, of subservient. Uh, there were restaurants where a, a black couldn't sit with the whites. Uh, they had to be in their own room, or, or, or whites and blacks couldn't sit together at a counter where they were eating lunch together. Uh, the, the blacks had to sit by themselves on a bus. They couldn't sit uh, where the whites were sitting. If there were not enough seats, then the blacks had to stand while the white people were able to sit. There were restrictive laws that kept blacks away from voting. And so when officials were elected, uh, they were elected without the influence and the input of, of the black community. And so Martin Luther King Jr. saw what was going on and, 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 he, and he surrounded himself with like-minded individuals. One young man was John Lewis. Uh, John Lewis was only about 18 years old when he became concerned about these, uh, these unjust laws in America. And so he began to integrate uh, these, these places, where the cafes and restaurants uh, that didn't allow blacks to come in. As, as a young black man, he would enter and oftentimes be arrested because of that. Uh, he, he was a part of marches like the famous march in, from, in, into Selma. Where, where hundreds of, 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 of blacks and, and people who were against these oppressive segregationist laws came together and marched across the bridge only to be beaten mercilessly um, by, by the, the police and the ones who were supposed to be there to take care of them. Fighting against these injustices, well, they developed a strategy that became very effective a strategy, not just how do you handle this situation all at once, but how do you get it into bite-sized pieces? And how do you approach significant wins in small ways? They fought against the oppressive voting restrictions in Mississippi. Uh, they they uh, fought against the segregation of buses in interstate travel. They held a huge march uh, in, in Washington, D.C., and thousands of people came to hear the stirring message of Martin Luther King, Jr., and also of John Lewis. Step by step, they began to overthrow the narrative and the oppressiveness of an unjust system. The Apostle Paul, when he came to know Christ, his burden was for the rest of his his Jewish brothers and sisters. He was so burdened by them that Paul said, I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ 
for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. God gave him the burden for his brothers and sisters. It brought great sorrow. How can he be happy when his fellow brothers and sisters were still darkened in their understanding? A life of passion. I'm a preacher in the United States. Uh, if a preacher's desire is to please their hearers, or if members of Congress or members of the Parliament, if they spend their energies on just party politics, they'll never challenge injustice. Corrupt systems are taken down, destroyed by passionate leaders who hate evil and love goodness. Uh, they value the lives of all and they champion the causes of the voiceless. Uh, some of these who have helped change cultures are like John Lewis that I just mentioned, or, or Granville Sharp. Uh, there's another a, a woman, Gloria Kwasi, who still lives. She, she and her husband Ben live in Josh, Nigeria. Uh, 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 ben is the Archbishop of the Anglican Church in, in, in Nigeria, northern Nigeria. Gloria, his wife, found her life by giving herself away. Her burden was for children. Because of the wars and the conflicts in Nigeria, many ch uh, children had been orphaned. Just yesterday, the day before we filmed this program, a, 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 a horrible thing happened where 140 children were kidnapped from school in northern Nigeria. Uh, the, these, these horrible people came in and broke down the walls and they kidnapped children, the 140 children, boys and girls. They took them off into the, into the, the, the jungles and, and, and they, this is not an unusual thing. Since December, in, in just seven months, there have been over a thousand children who have been kidnapped by these ruthless individuals. The government in Nigeria seems to be ineffective in dealing with them. Uh, the nations around the world that should be horrified by these tragedies have remained uncomfortably silent. As a result, uh, there are several million people in Nigeria who have been displaced. Many men and women have been killed, uh, even in their own homes, in their own beds, when these vigilantes come into their villages at night. It left thousands of children as orphans. Some of these will just be abandoned by the side of the road. And, and so Gloria had a burden for them, and Gloria began to reach out to these children, and, and she and Ben legally adopted them. We've been in their home. We have met the 60 children pulled from off the streets that Ben and Gloria have adopted to live in their own home. She had a burden for these children, and as a result, she did something about it. She said, I can help these children. The Apostle Paul said, I press on so that I may lay hold of that which was laid hold of me by Christ Jesus. How can we experience the life that God has given to us? How can we discern this call of God in our lives? Well, it's an ongoing process. It encourages us even in the darkest moments of our life. And it brings joy to us when we realize that God is at work in us. Do you know God's kingdom assignment for you? Are you pursuing it with passion? Our greatest impact on society comes when we're right in the center of God's will. But God's grace and God's mercy and because of God's love for us, I pray that we will pursue with all diligence the plan that God has for our lives so that we can make a difference in our world. God bless you.